So let us know if someone comes in this door, I want to get started. How is that going to affect the last? We have we told everyone to go around. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Who is this? Miss Dana? Oh my goodness. Look at that door. Oh, oh no. Yes, that's beautiful. Yeah. Miss Bennett, is that Selma Bennett? Yes. That's your sister, Miss Bennett? It's such a small world. Oh, my goodness. And is that both of you again? Oh, oh. So we're going to stand these and give them back to you. Yeah. Yeah. We can stand up and give them back. We're not gonna keep your photos. We're gonna have them and give them back to you. Oh, look at you! You said go by yourself. <laughs> look at you! So we are about to start. So this is up here. Okay. Okay, hold on. My um, my can we start the webinar? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I will remove my mask. Oh. Yeah. Which I'm Oh, please. The webinar has started. Okay, welcome everyone. So what for us is a very exciting event. It's small, it's private, that's how we intended it to be. This is my first in-person public um, event and I'm a little nervous about it, but it was nothing more important than this. So I'm Gwendolyn Reese and I'm president of the African-American Heritage Association of St. Pete. St. Petersburg, Florida, Inc. And my name is John Wilson. I'm vice president of the organization uh, Gwen just mentioned. And together we are the dynamic duo. Remember that. Yes. <laughs> what, what we used to That's what we were called, the dynamic duo. And uh, we're just wonderful together. John and I have a friendship. It goes back to Rosalie Peck, mm -hmm. who was a mentor of mine and a friend of his. And Rosalie brought us together in death. She brought us together, not she in life. She uh, insisted that both of us would speak at her funeral. Mm -hmm. And neither one of us wanted to do that, but she forced us to do that. And that's where our friendship started. So talk about the stories in the African-American community. Our community is full of these incredible, rich and robust stories. Mm -hmm. And thanks to of um, the African-American Heritage Association, the city of St. Pete, the Department of Planning and Preservation. We've been fortunate enough to develop the African-American Heritage Trail, and it's been six or seven years, and now we're moving into the 21st century. We're moving forward by having a digitized trail. It's remarkable, and you might mention what our next project will be yeah. after the digitization, the Methodist town trail uh, oh, we hope to organize too uh, it's just in its beginning stages but it's on our minds and we're thinking about it it's a promise we made to dorothy Whitlock years right. ago when we were meeting at the greenhouse and dorothy kept saying don't forget methodist town you cannot forget methodist town and we promised her we would and and we won't so today um we're here to celebrate and it's really special because we're celebrating you the people who are here in the room with us, the people who gave up their time to come out and be interviewed and what they contributed has just made the, the trail and our, our video team can talk about that. You have just made it so robust, so full, so wonderful by your interviews. And so we're so happy and we want to acknowledge you. We want the world to see you. And so that's why we're doing this hybrid because we wanted you in person to come to the screening and hear from us how much we appreciate you. So the mayor is here. And uh, before he comes up, I'm going to embarrass him. And I have the right to do that. 
This is probably the last time I will be speaking publicly about my mayor, our mayor. And I want to say publicly to him how much I appreciate him. I want to say public to him how much he has done yeah. to advance yeah. racial equity yeah. in this case. Seventy-two years young. Right. I've been in the city all of my life. I've worked with many administrations, and this is the first administration that ever uttered the word equity. Mm. This is the first administration that was comfortable saying the word racism. You know, equity wasn't the word back then, it was equality, but other administrations didn't even talk about equality. But this mayor has. He 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 flew the, the gay pride flag over the city hall for the gay pride month. He flew the Dr. Carter G. Woodson flag over City Hall for Black History Month. Under him, we have been declared a, a city of compassion. Under him, we have been declared a city of law. Under him, St. Petersburg became the first city in the state of Florida to declare racism a public health crisis. And our mayor, was bold and courageous because he commissioned a study to look at structural racism yes, yes. in the city of St. Pete. Yes. is lift up his work so that it continues when he is no longer at the helm. So that when he passes the leadership over to Mayor-elect Welch, he will pick it up and keep moving forward and advancing these issues. So without further ado, and there are tears in his eyes, I'm gonna welcome Mayor Price from my mayor, your mayor, our mayor, up to give a few words. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone, and uh, and welcome, and especially for, for those who are here in person and for those who are uh, watching virtually. Uh, my thanks to Nicole Slaughter Graham for inviting me into Tombola Books, one of St. Pete's best bookstores and small businesses. Thank you for hosting us uh, A special word of thanks to my friend, uh, and I might add, recipient of the key to the city of St. Pete. Wendell Lewis. Gwen has a deep love for the city. I'm not telling you all something you don't know. More importantly, she has a deep love for the history of the city. The good and equally important, the not so good. She's the president, as she said, of the African American Heritage Association, which is the association that's given the city the gift of the African American Heritage Trail. And she's been an outspoken advocate for the city. She's been a friend to me and to our administration and I'm very grateful to her friendship. I also wanna say uh, another thank you to uh, another friend who has also received the key to the city, uh, John Wilson, who is the vice president of the African American City. John is a man who's probably forgotten more about St. Petersburg than most of us will ever know. Uh, so if you've, if you've ever heard me give a speech uh, over the past eight years, you've, you've heard me talk about the city's vision statement. Uh, and unfortunately, you're gonna hear me say it again tonight, but I, I'm saying it because uh, I think the Heritage Trail and this project of digitizing the trail fits perfectly within our vision of who we wanna be as a city. So St. Petersburg will be a city of opportunity where the sun will shine on all, on all who come to live, work, and play. And this trail has been a huge step forward in allowing the sun to shine on all of this community, especially people of color living south of Central. Now, the second half of the vision statement says that we will be an innovative, creative, and competitive community that honors its past as we pursue our future honors its past as we pursue our future. We don't learn about our history. We're destined to repeat the mistakes that we've made as we move forward into the future. And so again, this trail, your association, helps us learn about and honor our past as we pursue our future. And while I recognize that 
an African American Heritage Trail may not be unique to our city. I know that St. Petersburg wouldn't be what it is without it. And our hope of achieving our vision would be much more difficult without this. The African American Heritage Trail is so important to our community because it tells the history and emphasizes the importance and the impact of the African American community in and on our city. So in digitizing the trail, we are preserving that message for generations to come. So let me uh, just conclude my comments by thanking the sponsors for making this uh, happen. Premier Eye Care, the Florida Holocaust Museum, the Foundation for a Healthy St. Petersburg, and the African American Heritage Association. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. I hope it's not the last time that I get to acknowledge you in public. We, we I would be remiss if we didn't thank Carla Brooks. They have been our partners. Uh, we, in case you don't know, we have a monthly commun community conversation. And, uh, and that's done with, in partnership with Carla Brooks, we've had some incredible speakers. Um, last month, we talked about the Chitlin circuit. And coming up in February, March, and April, we're going to do a three month um, viewing and discussion on exterminate all the groups. Um, so we will be doing that for three months in a row. So we are just so happy that they've offered us that platform and that they offered us this space tonight. So we wanna get going with acknowledgements because then you get to have um, to screen um, the digitized trail. It will be completed in December, but we wanted to bring all of you together who gave of your time and told your incredible stories so you could see it together. So you're getting a sneak preview, although the rest of the world is watching it either via Zoom or uh, a live stream on, on Facebook. So we have some acknowledgments we want to make, and we could not have done this without our sponsors. Right. And so uh, we would like to acknowledge our sponsors. And so Carl Lavender from the Foundation for a Healthy City. Carl, please say a few words. Yeah. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so my friends are supposed to know. <laughs> Good evening. On behalf of the Foundation for a Health in Petersburg, we are thrilled with the investment that we made in this project. Uh, we are your philanthropy and race. We cannot ever forget our roots in that from the Mound Park Hospital to Bayfront, which was sold, which created our corpus of $180 million. We owe it to the Black community, and we will never forget that. And so hold us accountable in this regard. On behalf of our president, Randy Russell, and our board chair, Donna Peterson, we thank you all for your work. And Gwen and John, we love you both very, very much. God bless you. We're not supposed to talk about money, but I don't believe that. And so I want to thank the foundation for a $60,000 grant. And so, the Florida Holocaust Museum. Evening. My name is Erin Blankenship. I'm the Interim Executive Director at the Florida Holocaust Museum. And I'm here on behalf of our board and staff at the museum because we are so excited to be part of this project. Um, in case you don't know, it's, it's crazy that I can now say it's been several years since um, Gwendolyn Reese and John Wilson um, helped us with an exhibition that we were doing, our award-winning Beaches, Benches, and Boycotts exhibition. Mm -hmm. And because of that partnership, 
how could I, how could we not want to partner on this? How could we not want to help such an important project? We believe in telling stories because we know that there is power in those stories to make change today. And this is just an excellent project to do just that. And so with our mobile guide, we'll be, have, you'll be able to either take it in hand as you walk down the Heritage Trail or enjoy it in your homes. And it's, it just gives all of those incredible stories, your stories at people's fingertips. So we're just really honored to be a part of this project. And I'm looking forward to meeting with Nicole, I think later this week. Hi, <laughs> So we're really excited. So thank you for allowing us to be a part of this. If not for the Holocaust, this project would not have happened. The Holocaust Museum came to us and I don't know the technical terms, okay? So I don't know if you had the app and you offered us the platform and you had the platform and you offered us, but something happened there. And so, just like that. <laughs> okay, just like that. They came to us and that's why partnerships are so important. We had always partnered with them and when they had this opportunity, they came to us. And then from our next uh, sponsor who is joining us via Zoom, Lorna Taylor. Lorna sponsored the part um, that we are using in this app or platform. And so Lorna, we have a certificate for you and Lorna is ready to say a few words to you uh, virtually. Thank you, Gwen. I am so appreciative to the African-American Heritage Association and the Florida Holocaust Museum, both beacons for equity and guardians of essential historical stories for inviting Premier to participate in this historically important project. African-American history and culture are an integral part of the ethos of our community. In order to understand each other and continue to progress forward, clothing the, closing the structural equity gaps, it's essential that these stories are available for everyone to hear, celebrate, and take to heart. This project resonated with me on two levels. First, the importance of telling the stories and sharing the rich cultural heritage of the neighborhood that is the historical heart and soul of St. Petersburg's African-American community. The importance of sharing the stories of community leaders, Jordan Park, iconic businesses, and the journey of this neighborhood from the Jim Crow era through segregation and then through the civil rights movement. This is such an important history. And by us coming together to digitize these stories, we are making them available to students, educators, researchers, and the general public on a state, national, and even global level. The second reason that this project resonated with me was because of Gwendolyn Reese, whose leadership as president of the African American Heritage Association, which is only one of the many leadership roles she holds, has had such a positive impact on our larger community. Gwendolyn is a St. Petersburg treasure who is nationally respected as a preeminent storyteller and educator on black history, life and culture. We are each enriched by her life's ever growing body of work and her relentless longtime commitment to equity. It was an honor to join these other community partners to be a small part of protecting and telling these essential and sacred stories. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to introduce the team that made it possible. And this is our creative team. And so we're just gonna ask all three of you to come up when we call your name. And so the project manager is Nicole Slaughter Graham. <laughs> The photo editor and videographer is my friend, Boyce El Hosey. My newest friend is Chris Zuppa. Zuppa. They have done an incredible amount of work. Those of you who were interviewed, you can ask them. You, you, you know, you, you saw how they uh, conducted those interviews, their personality, but when you see um, what they've done, it's just incredible. And so we owe you so much gratitude uh, for what you put into it, because you took it to heart. It wasn't a job for you. It was something that you took to heart, and we could tell it. You were committed, 
you cared about it. And we thank you so much for that. And we want the entire world to see our creative team. Thank you so much. I do want to say anything yeah, I just think uh, I love both of those figures. My wife, Becky, especially like the education one because she spent 20 years in the Pinellas County school system. I like the one about 22nd Street, and I watched that three or four times. And every time that music started, man, I got chills. I'm getting it right now just talking about it. So you all did a lovely, wonderful job. Thank you so much. It's on my phone, y'all, because I'm not as gifted as speakers either of them. But um, I wanted to thank you all for trusting us with your stories. Um, you guys shared parts of your lives with us. You shared photos. You shared documents. You shared yourselves. And we are forever changed because of it. And I just wanted to say thank you so, so much for giving us the time, the space, and for trusting us with your stories in the history. See, I tried to make a hasty exit because I like being behind the camera. But um, as uh, Ms. Reese said, it's such an important um, project. And when Nicole approached me about the idea and the concept, I said, wow, this is wonderful. First of all, I get a chance to work again with Ms. Reese, who is the most gifted uh, historian and storyteller I've ever met, and to work again with John Wilson. Again, because we both were together at the Tampa Bay Times. And so, you know, I've been in St. Pete for 23 years. And uh, so these stories, I'm just now really starting to wrap my head around the significance and the importance of this. A lot of it is familiar, right? Because most of you are like mom and dads and aunts and uncles and cousins. And I know these stories, but to put it in context in St. Petersburg, what a wonderful opportunity. And um, I just knew that if uh, Mr. Reese was asking to do it, the answer was going to be yes. And I knew that we couldn't fumble the ball. But, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, so, you know, I've done a few things to say, Pete. I'm just so happy. It's all about the storytelling. Yes. Um, and there's one guy, when I told Nicole, I said, listen, I said, I'll come on board, but I gotta have Chris and Bill. Because this man right here is one of the best storytellers and video editors around. And so you're going to get a chance to see it all of us tonight. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to echo what uh, Nicole said, thank you for everyone who took the time to talk to us. Um, it's your story, um, and it's really important. And when boys out, texted me uh, and asked if I would help with the project, I didn't hesitate because it's uh, it's really important that these stories live long uh, for years to come. Um, for me, this story began when I was an intern at the Times back in 2002. Uh, back in July, my first day, I saw the um, deuces spread being laid out that John and Jamie had been working on. And it was like, it was the most amazing experience just to walk in the doors at the Times as an intern and see such powerful storytelling. So to stand up here and be working on this story with John, who sort of started this, um, and Jamie as well, who's not here in St. Pete anymore, it's it's uh, it's incredible. It's an incredible honor, and I hope to continue to do justice to the stories. Thank you. Highlight before the highlight of actually viewing, uh, doing the pre screening. But Nicole is going to help us as we uh, acknowledge and give thanks to those who uh, came out and, and gave up their time. So I know that everyone is not here. Um, and so if you are receiving for someone, when you hear their name, please come forward. So the first name we have is Joan Reed. And her sister Velma Thompson is here to receive it for her. So please show what we're giving. So we have a certificate of appreciation for you. 
And also one of the photos that we took while we were recording. So our photographers took portraits of you when you came to be interviewed. And so we're giving you a framed copy of your portrait and a certificate of, of thanks for the time that you gave. So Belle, please come forward and receive yours and your sister, Joni. Thank you. This next one is, uh, I'm so happy to award this because it's to your friend, Betty Harden, who's helped us tell stories now for quite a long time. And as I look out over the audience, there she is. Right there. Yep. And will you show us her portrait? Lucinda Grant, who told the most deeply moving story about growing up in Jordan Park as I listened to that part of the video. And so Lucinda, thank you so much. Show her picture to everyone. <laughs> We could, we're going to call these two people up together. John will call one, I'll call the other. First person, uh, also a dear friend, Irene Pridgen, please. And her sister, Sylvia Jenkins. We use their portrait together. We thank you both. Yes. We thank you both. Yes, uh, their father was the first African American realtor um, in this county and suffered uh, or dealt with, he didn't suffer, he was a strong, brave man, but he dealt with racism in many forms as uh, he tried to, as he uh, secured housing for African Americans in neighborhoods that were not typically African Americans. So they have a very rich history. Um, in this city, and their father's business was on the deuces. So, oh, so now we have Thelma Bruce and Ethel Peoples Robinson. Working together to tell the story of Fanny Air Ponder and the National Council of Negro Women, and you can see them in their uh, NCNW attire. So you're looking at it. To the audience, see that beautiful picture? Yes. Six gentlemen. Is Paul Stewart, who has a long history in St. Petersburg. He uh, is uh, very close to some of the baseball players, uh, Major League Baseball players, who came to St. Pete and couldn't stay in the same hotels as the white uh, uh, teammates. And so uh, they lived in, in uh, some of the houses uh, where Paul lived. And is he here tonight, or is there someone who is? We will make sure that he receives it. We will hang on to it. Yes. And so next, I'm going to call this name, so I'm going to embarrass her whatever she is. Um, the next one goes to Lolita Brown, and she's, she's not going to like this, but uh, we graduated from high school together. She was my maid of honor when I married my first husband. She uh, is the godmother of my daughter, and she was witness to my divorce from that first husband. <laughs> And so we have a very, very long history together. And so this is Lolita's portrait. And she came to share. Um, she has a rich history. Her, her paternal grandmother was uh, one of the Black midwives in St. Petersburg. Her father was principal of Wildwood Elementary. Her mother, Lena Brown, was our counselor at Gibbs High School. But Lolita uh, talked about attending school at Jordan Park. 
Elementary. So we thank her for that contribution to our digitized trail. Thank you, Lolita. Mrs. Bennett, you're next. We're going to call your name. Please do not get up. We will bring it to you. Maddie Bennett. And will you show her beautiful portrait? Bennett, Mrs. Bennett is, um, help me with this. Um, Mrs. Bennett is the oldest living nurse from Mercy Hospital. Wow. And when she came for her interview, she brought pictures and posters and she had such a story to tell. And our photographers and videographers were able um, to capture that. And even tonight, she shared two pictures when she was this young, fine nurse with her sister, <laughs> Zelma Reddy. And so Mrs. Bennett has been providing services to our community for years and years. And we're so happy, uh, Mrs. Bennett, that we're able to honor you. But more importantly, we're so happy that your story is a part of our trail now. Thank you so much. And so along with Mrs. Bennett is uh, my friend, Vienna Adams. And she is, um, actually, she, she brought Mrs. Bennett tonight and she brought her for her interview. And she is um, retired, but she is also a nurse. And she was at the Pinellas County Health Department for a long, long time. She also knew Maria personally. And she, Mrs. Yop was a mentor of hers. And uh, Vienna made sure that we included Mrs. Yop in our story. And so we thank you so much for all that you provided to us and the rich stories that you told. Thank you very much. And this is from her Not only were these people gifted with their stories, you see how beautiful they were, yes. or they are. <laughs> I have a certificate here for Mr. Ron Gregg. And his wife, Betty, is coming Betty, to Mark, accept yes. it. Paul Ron is a musician, and uh, we are loving Ron has appeared tonight. So uh, Betty came uh, in his place, and Ron shared all of his stories about the Manhattan Casino, and all of the musicians that were a part of our community. And so we're going to show you Ron's portrait. Ron is a well-known uh, drummer. And uh, Betty and Ron have been involved with uh, actually keeping the Al Downing Jazz Association going for many, many years. And that's also history. And that's also a rich part of our, our, our heritage in the city. And they're celebrating their 50th anniversary. <laughs> she corrected me, and I think you understood. We didn't mean their anniversary. We meant the Al Downing Jazz Association. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we have a family of three and they're not here with us tonight, but we're going to show their portraits. And it's Patricia Smith Johnson. We hope that she's listening or watching virtually. Her sister, Barbara Smith Kennedy, and their brother, Melvin Smith Jr. So we have a portrait for each of them. And uh, those of you who live here, you know their father and his role at the Royal Theater. He was the ticket taker, the bouncer, the disciplinary, who sold the refreshments. He was Mr. Royal Theater. He also drove a Blue Star cab. So it was very much a part of our community. And they came to talk about their father because his picture is actually on one of our markers. So they're not here with us tonight, but we will make sure that they get their token of appreciation. And then finally, before we start um, viewing, um, we want to thank our supporters. So we've mentioned some of them. So are you going to stay back there? Are you, so you're going to let Nicole take care of so Tumbalo Books. Thank you. 
Candace. Okay. <laughs> some media people who were really, really um, positive and behind this, and they went beyond the ordinary in helping us tell our story. And Mary is here tonight, Seddon from WUSF News. Um, and so she read it, and in one of our articles, there was something that really caught her attention. And they actually did a, a couple of programs around that. But she's been following us and been very much a supporter. And we thank you, Mary. Others are not here, but we will mention their names. We're very thankful to visit St. Pete Clearwater. We have a landing page on their website. We are thankful to the, the Woodson, and I'm going to use their new name, the Woodson Museum of Florida. Historical Museum of Florida. It's no longer the Carter G. Woodson, so it's the Woodson African American Museum of Florida. Um, and our first taping was done in their facility, so we thank them. The Tampa Bay Times and uh, Monique Welch in particular, she's no longer with the Times, but she was very helpful and supportive. So, boys, though, we will let you take this back to somebody at the Times. The Weekly Challenger has always been supportive. Um, and we thank them for the job that they do. Um, the legacy that Lynn keeps going, the legacy uh, of her father, and that newspaper has always been so important to our community, and we're so happy to see it continuing. Um, SPC Foundation, St. Pete College Foundation, they gave our team uh, just an open invitation to the Minson Rubin Historical Collection. And so our team was able to go in and utilize many of the pictures in that collection. And we were so thankful to them. And then I cannot uh, not mention former Mayor Bill Foster because Mayor Foster, former Mayor Foster planted the seed for all of this. He didn't know that's what he was doing. I hear Irene back there saying, uh-huh. Because Irene has been with us from the beginning as has Betty and, and John. And all Mayor Foster said was, there are all these rich stories and, and we're losing them. What can you do? And we came together and we thought we were gonna do a brochure, didn't we, Irene? And we ended up with a 20 mile per trail. And now we're ending up with the digitization of that trail that can be seen around the world. So I always want to acknowledge him. And so that is the end of our acknowledgements. And so I think I'm turning it over to Nicole who is going to introduce you to the private screening of a part of the digitized African-American Heritage Trail. Please enjoy. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We, um, we're gonna show you some videos you may have seen, and we're gonna show you some videos that you have not seen yet. And we are really, really excited to be able to do that. Um, we picked eight videos total. We're gonna start out with our first trailer, um, which gives you a feel for the project as a whole. Um, so we're just getting set up on that, and you'll be able to see that in a moment. We would like to welcome you to a tour of the African American Heritage Trail. The Deuces, as we so lovingly call it, was a thriving Black business section. At one time, there were over 111 Black-owned, Black-operated, and Jewish-owned businesses. The beginning of 22nd Street took place in the 1920s. That's when the street really began to pick up. And previous to that, it was basically a dirt trail out in the woods. I love this quote that says, our stories are messy, they're complicated, they're beautiful, but they must be told. Our father just, in the words of bond, he just used that with everybody he met. He also would teach us, you know better than anybody else, but you know less. 
of Quest Joint Park was a friendly neighborhood. And everybody that lived in Joint Park took care of everybody else. So you had a family atmosphere. Let's go to the very beginning. In 1868, when John Donaldson was the first African-American to come to what we called the Pinellas Peninsula. And so our trail actually covers the first 100 years of the African-American presence in St. Petersburg. Ms. Bennett was one of um, the first nurses who integrated at my own park, which is now Bayfront. Including that, she worked at Mercy Hospital till she retired. Maybe I can say, yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a job, it was close to home. I could just walk in distance. And uh, we knew a lot of the patients. Uh, when I was a kid, our house was located two blocks south of the Manhattan Casino. And I could hear the music being played by the bands that would come there and smell the barbecue from Geek's Flight's barbecue stand. At that time, his sons took over the grocery store and the grocery store was in the family for about 50 years. We had doctors, lawyers, tailors and barbers for you. We had the Royal Theater, the Royal Hotel too. Mercy Hospital, pharmacies, grocery stores too. Soda fountains, shoe repairs. And when life was through, there was a well-established funeral home to bury you. All of this flourished in a neighborhood where Black families lived, worked, prayed, and died, teaching children to be good. Yes, the heart of this community was 22nd Street. The next video we're going to show you will be at the Jordan Park marker. Well, when we moved in, of course, Joint Park was a friendly neighborhood and everybody that lived in Joint Park took care of everybody else. We hear all the time, it takes a village to raise a child. And in the black community, we had many villages. Jordan Park was a village. Every family that I can remember, they all looked out for each other. We knew that if we got in trouble and that mother told our mother, then we could be up for some real trouble. So in the 1930s, uh, the St. Pete Housing Authority undertook uh, a survey of uh, what was called substandard housing. The Housing Authority decided that uh, for the good of the city and so many of the people who lived in it, there, there needed to be uh, a facility that would offer a better place to live and a better life. And that's how the idea of Jordan Park was born. When Jordan Park opened, it did open in two phases. 240 units opened in 1940 and 240 units opened in 1941. But it has so many of the amenities that a lot of the other housing uh, did not have. When we moved into Jordan Park, we moved into what I would call a really, really nice um, location because we were on the front end. Our number was 625 Jordan Park, and it was an upstairs, downstairs building, and we had three bedrooms. It became the first step to home ownership. It was upward mobility for the Black community. Yes. This, uh, I'm told, was seen as a desirable residence for people on 22nd Street, which was already becoming a, a main thoroughfare. And when Jordan Park was established, uh, it helped the businesses and it helped the city grow. Angela Bassett lived in St. Petersburg and spent some of her years growing up in Jordan Park. Paul Mike Ray, gastroenterologist, grew up in Jordan Park. Uh, Ron Gregg, drummer with the Al Downing Jazz Association, grew up in Jordan Park. Out of Jordan Park have come some great people and not great in the sense of being nationally known, just good and great people, yes. When I think about Joan Park 
and being able to grow up there as a young child. It gave me meaning to my life as an adult. And just a little old girl, black girl from Joy Park that went to join elementary school, 16th Street Middle School in Dixon Holland's High. All those places have made a difference in who I am today, how I live my life, and what I bring to others and to myself. Um, the next video we're going to show you is our second trailer. This one speaks to the importance and place of education within the community. In our homes, we were taught that education is the key, that if you go to school and do your very best, learn what you can. We were told that we could be anything we wanted to be. We can't really talk about the Black community unless we talk about education because education has always been so key to Black people, even during the time of enslavement. The city was divided because some lived on the south side and some lived on the north side. So the only way I got to see the north side kids were when they came to the war theater. Melvin Smith, he was Mr. Royal Theater. He might take your ticket. He might serve you at the concession stand. He might kick you out if you were misbehaving. I had twin beds in my room and Roberto Clemente was my roommate for four days when they would come up to play the Cardinals. Dr. Swain said, you know, we're just encouraging further segregation by having this apartment building for black players. And so we're gonna stop doing that. Hmm. When I think about it, um, that school was the mainstay of the community. A lot of people have always said that the Black church was the heartbeat of the community. Until desegregation, the Black schools were the heartbeat of the community. This will be on the trail in front of uh, Jordan Elementary. So this one is about, um, it dives further into the importance of education and the schools that were available in the community. We can't really talk about the black community unless we talk about education because education has always been so key to Black people, even during the time of enslavement. Black people risked their lives to learn how to read and write. In our homes, we were taught that education is the key, that if you go to school and do your very best, learn what you can, decide you're gonna be somebody, that that was the way to do it, through education. And so from, from little children, we were told that, we could be anything we wanted to be. In St. Petersburg, in 1914, the first black school was built and that was Davis Academy, later to become Davis Elementary. And uh, it served the black community. It was only open about six months out of the year. So then Jordan Elementary was built and immediately it was overcrowded, but there was no high school. So the education for black students ended in sixth grade until 1927 when Gibbs High opened. I did my first growing up uh, on 7th Avenue South, 2327, which is about three blocks from the Jordan Elementary School. A lot of people have always said that the Black church was the heartbeat of the community. 
until desegregation, the black schools were the heartbeat of the community. Mm. When I think about it, um, that school was the mainstay of the community. You know, that's where people um, gathered for programs and other things that happened in the community at that time. Gibbs football games, the whole black community came to the football games. Elementary school May Day, I played at the Maypole in third grade at Campbell Park. The whole black community came for May Day celebrations. So I think it was the schools that really brought us together as one community. Because on Sundays, we were in different churches. So the role that education played, our teachers didn't just teach us. Our teachers lived in the community with us. They went to church with us. Um, our parents knew them. They sat at the table with us in the cafeteria. And that's when you learn your etiquette lessons. That's when you learn not to talk with food in your mouth. Our teachers didn't just teach us academics. They taught us how to dress, decorum, etiquette. They taught us everything we needed to be successful in life. We're now going to show you the video that will be in front of the Manhattan Casino. We have uh, some very clear memories of uh, the Manhattan Casino and the area. Uh, when I was a kid, our house was located two blocks uh, south of the Manhattan Casino. And I could hear the music being played by the bands that would come there, be it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday nights. And also I could smell the barbecue from each barbecue stand. <laughs> The jewel of 22nd Street was the Manhattan Casino. And people often think of it as only as a place where great musicians came and boy, did they come. But it was also like a cultural center. I know Gibbs High would have hold his proms there. Uh, the civic organizations and women's clubs would have their affairs there. It was the place to be. I was in high school at the time, so I had to be like, uh, 15, 16, 17 years old. Yeah, I wasn't old enough to go into the Manhattan Casino, but I could hear all the music. Right across the street from the Manhattan, it's Snow Peak. That me and my buddies, we pull the cars up, we got them lined up. And we'd all be on the hood of the car, leaning back on the windshield, listening to the music coming out of the Manhattan Casino. I was not old enough to get into the Manhattan Casino at the time, but I do remember, uh, my mother's club had a big affair there. She said, oh, I want you to do something for our club. I said, what you want me to do, mom? She said, I want to pass out um, the uh, party favors and hats and go beep. So oh, I said, this is my chance to go up to America had to see him. But you had to stay back in the club room. You couldn't come on the dance floor because that was not allowed. Black musicians and artists couldn't play in the larger venues. So throughout the South, they played in places like the Manhattan Casino. So the Manhattan was also a part of the Chitlin circuit. But if white people wanted to hear these world-renowned musicians, they still had to come to the Manhattan. Ray Charles wrote a song in about 1950, 51, while he was uh, playing the Manhattan, I think. And it's called the St. Petersburg, Florida Blues. And it's... Uh, not the greatest song you've ever heard. Uh, I think the line in it is, I left my baby there down in St. Petersburg, Florida. I can say that the Manhattan Casino uh, was uh, good to me. In fact, that it struck a, a, a light under me to enhance and continue what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I'm doing that. I'm playing music.
before we play the next one, I just want to, I keep saying this will be in front of, and y'all are probably like, <laughs> what does that mean? What I mean is, um, thanks to the Florida Holocaust Museum, people will be able to pull up these videos on their phones as they're walking the African American Heritage Trail. So they'll not only have the information that's on the marker, they'll have access to your stories right there on the trail as they're walking. And for those who are maybe out of the area or not able to get to the walking trail, they'll have these stories right at their fingertips on their computers or any other device that they may have. Um, we're gonna move on now to the Royal Theater. Here we are standing in front of the Royal Theater, one of the two black theaters that served our community. The so, right, the other one was the Harlem Theater over on Third Avenue. It's no longer there due to the Tropicana Field development. One of the things that the Royal Theater meant to me uh, was that it was like a social gathering where all the people in the community uh, came together. I don't remember my parents going to the Royal Theater, but boy, do I remember Saturday afternoon matinees. In fact, the first kiss I ever got was at the Royal Theater. Yeah. On the weekends, you always had new movies. Like the movies, new movies would come out uh, on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, then Wednesday would be the, a talent show that I remember. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday would be new movies again, so. A lot of the musicians who grew up to go around the country performing started out on the stage at the Royal Theater. I was also very, very proud that my dad worked here and that I could get him free. And if I like you and you're my friend, I got you in with me free too, so. Melvin Smith, who's on, on this marker, he was Mr. Royal Theater. He might take your ticket. He might serve you at the concession stand. He might pick you out if you were misbehaving. The young people was not allowed to sit in the back. The adults sit in the back. The young kids had to sit up front. Of course, I was being out of line and out of place. He was a standout guy at that theater and all the kids loved my dad for some reason. I don't know what it was about him, what he gave to them, how he spoke to them, how he treated them, but they all was happy when they saw Mr. Smith. That's why we honored him on this marker because of the role he played uh, with the Royal Theater. And the Royal Theater is another one of the buildings in the Black community with historic designation. Yes. Um, as you all know, there's three markers in front of Mercy Hospital. One of them explains in detail um, about the RN club and the doctors that were responsible for making sure Mercy Hospital was staffed. Um, this will be that first marker. And here we are now standing in front of the historic Mercy Hospital. Mercy Hospital opened in 1923. The first African-American to the Pinellas Peninsula came in 1868. So from 1868, to 1923, there was no hospital for African-Americans. And then the city built Mercy Hospital. And in 1926, they named Dr. James Mike C. Ponder, the city physician. Well, uh, when I finished nursing, uh, Dr. Ponder was the only black physician here at that time. And my parents asked him that he Maybe it could be with the Eagle or in Surreal and get me a job there. So he said, I'll try. And he talked to the uh, uh, supervisor, Mr. Allen. She gave me a job there on the day shift. Dr. Ponda recruited all the other physicians, and we called them the five pioneering black physicians. And that included Dr. Elsa, Dr. Wimbish, Dr. Ayer, Dr. Talifera, Dr. Rose. But there had been one other, and that was Bro Martin. 
But Dr. Martin said he could not deal with the racism here in the city, and he left and went to Ohio. When we talk about Mercy Hospital, I always think about uh, Dr. Ralph Wimbish, who is not only a gifted physician, but he was president of the uh, NAACP. He had a, a nice house on 15th Avenue South and wanted to build a swimming pool, and the city, for some reason, wouldn't let him. So what he did was build his swimming pool in the front yard, kind of a, a way to say, look, I'm, I'm going to do this. and this is how far we've progressed. We have to remember that even though a hospital was built for the Black community, it was never adequately equipped. It was never adequately staffed. So I think there were about two or three additions to the hospital to try to accommodate the growing population. But there was no x-ray lab. There were so many things missing. Just give you a little... Um, back history. Mrs. Jopp, um, originally from Tampa, married her husband and moved here and lived in the community of Jordan Park in the very early stages of the development there. And she attempted to get a job at Mercy Hospital. Now she had nursing experience. She had a nursing, I guess, certificate that she received from Florida a University. Then her husband um, went to the war, War II, and why he was there, she proceeded to get her bachelor's of science degree from Florida a and University. In 1946, she was able to get a job at Mercy Hospital. So she proceeded to do a lot of different things at Mercy Hospital. That's when she started the RNLPN Association, formerly known back then as the RN Club. <laughs> I actually remember the uh, uh, RN Club, original RN Club. Ms. Bennett um, was one of the charter members. And as being a charter member, they all took a part in a role in developing this organization. They set uh, procedures, policies of how nurses in the state of Florida were to uh, practice. And also Ms. Bennett was one of um, the first nurses who integrated at Mount Park, which is now Bayfront. It was Dr. Alsop, one of our pioneering black physicians who uh, desegregated what was then Mount Park. Our civil rights leaders were always our physicians, our attorneys, and our ministers. And Dr. Alsop fought against racism throughout his entire career. Mercy Hospital meant everything to the community. You know, back then, when you talk about a segregated community, you know, that's all you had, you know, between the doctors and nurses. And so they were more or less a, um, a mentor for the community, you know, encouraging them, you can do more, you can go further, you know, we've done it, come along, we'll help. So yeah, I think it meant a lot more than just a medical uh, facility. To, um kind of tie everything up in a nice bow. We're gonna give you our third um, trailer, which talks a lot about the end of the era and what has come um, after the trail's ending. We started at the beginning and now we're at the end of an era. We started with the first man, John Donaldson, and now we're here to the end of segregation. I think of Fanny Air Ponder. She was an educator and taught for 20 years at Yale, but she was also a woman who believed in people rights, human rights, and she fought tirelessly for that. I think of uh, the uh, 12 St. Petersburg police officers, the Courageous 12, who sued the city, their employer, so that they could police any part of town. That was during a time when St. Petersburg was completely segregated. Black people could not stay in the hotels, and they also couldn't eat in the restaurants downtown. And Sister Elizabeth Ann, oh, you would have to have met her to believe her. Since he had told her to bring us, they would have, read, they would have had seated us. 
And when she walked us in, she started naming her students as if to say, these are my students, they are children, they're human beings, you know, and they will be seated. Daddy always made it possible for us to go out and eat. Uh, it was very important for him, for his daughters to understand what it was like to go into a restaurant and sit down and have a meal. It's not the African-American story. It's the St. Petersburg story. Our story is just one of the patches in the quilt that makes up the history of this city, this state, and this nation. We are steadily working on the rest of the videos for the trail and we'll be sharing those soon. Um, but for now, I hope that kind of piques your interest in what we have coming next. Um, and I'm gonna invite Ms. Gwen and John back up here for a closing remark. Thank you. And John knew that, that when you started doing all the keeping out, but I, I couldn't. And so I stayed. And, and so we want to, we hope you're as excited as we are. We hope you're as pleased as we are. You just saw snippets. There's a lot more of your interviews throughout. Um, and so we can't wait until next month when our team has promised us that we will have a finished product. And our funders are saying that is the last month. <laughs> so, so we're really excited. So in December, we will not be doing an in-person unveiling. It will be all virtual. But then you will be able to share this with family and friends from around the country. People who may never come here and walk the trail, you can now share it with them. And so they can actually experience the trail as, as you can walking. And so John and I have pretty much said, we're tired of leading tours. <laughs> um, and we're sort of glad about this digitization because what it does is this is so much richer. Yeah, John and I are great. We really are. <laughs> When's the dynamic of this tour? <laughs> but now we hear have your voices. Yeah. Not just our voices, we have your voices. And that's what makes it so rich. And as Chris said, these are your stories, but they are making them come alive. And so we thank our team once again. Our sponsors, we thank our partners. We thank each and every one of you. You will be getting an invitation to the virtual unveiling so that you can see it all. So from the comfort of your room, you can tour the Ninth Avenue corridor or the 22nd Street corridor, because if we were leading the tour, we could never cover both corridors. You had to do one or the other, and they were 90 minutes long. So now you can sit, and we can sit. We tried to do both of them for a while, but uh, it didn't work out all that well. So we're excited and stay tuned, not just for the unveiling, but for our next phase two, which is Methodist Town. And we could not have done any of this, not just the digitization. We could not have done the trail without you because you all gave us pictures. Some of the pictures that you see um, on our markers, they came from you. Irene was a part of that. We did research for two and a half years to pull together what you see on those markers. But if people hadn't shared their photos, their memorabilia and their stories, we could not have done it. So when we start out from Methodist time, we need you again. And I want to make one announcement. On December 12th, 2021, a Sunday afternoon from 12 to 3 p.m. in parking lot number four, at Tropicana Field, we will be hosting the first 
Gas Plant and Laurel Park Neighborhood Reunion. <laughs> With funding from the foundation, Voices Heard, Voices Matters, the African American Heritage Association, of uh, the Black Life, uh, the Institute of Black Life at USF. Um, and I think we have another part, City of St. Pete. And so we are inviting people who live there, or they are direct descendants of someone who lived in either of those neighborhoods to really come out to the reunion. Everyone else can watch it virtually. But if you live there, you're getting a meal, you're getting a commemorative coin. Um, so this is a wonderful, another wonderful way to celebrate and lift up the rich history and heritage of our African-American neighborhoods. So stay tuned for that as well. And those are my closing words, John. I think you've uh, pretty much covered it. I just want to say that uh, all of you, our creative team, all of you who told the stories, our sponsors, you all have helped build community, and not just the community from which these stories came, but the wider community of St. Petersburg. You've made us better as a community, as a city, consequently as a state, and I dare say the nation. So I thank you all very, very much for everything that you've done. And these are our stories and we are the ones who should tell them. Amen. So we're taking back our power. Amen. Our stories have been whitewashed. They've been omitted. They've been denied. They've been rewritten. But now we are writing our own stories in our voices and we are telling them. Amen. And this is so very important. Thank you for being a part of this.